Lisa Beta, co-founder with Jessica Eves Matthews of Hopepreneurs, which is the girls club that inspires you to up your game. Welcome to another Hot Topics. Today we're going to be visiting with Joanne Wilson. Joanne is one of New York City's most respected angel investors, bloggers, and an advocate for women entrepreneurs. She is an active angel investor with a portfolio of over 90 companies, including Food52, Catch a Fire, Vengo, Nestio, Capture Proof, Makers Row, La Tote, and Union Station, as well as several restaurants in the New York area. Joanne is also the co-founder of the Women's Entrepreneur Festival, and she is the creator of the popular Gotham Gal blog, which she launched 11 years ago. Let's join Joanne Wilson now for today's hot topic. I mean, you know, it's like um, women who um, are in a company and a job comes up or something comes available and they think, well, the 10 qualifications for that, I don't have 10. Yeah. I have two, so I'm not going to do it. Whereas a guy would be, in general, again, generalist, would be like, well, I'll just fake it till I make it. Like, yeah, I can do that. I'm Even halfway though, there. Yeah. <laughs> right. And women don't do that. And women should do more of that. So I think that, yes, you were right, that their, that their success rate ends up becoming more intensified because of that. Is there anything that you've been able to learn and glean from the years that you've worked that have helped identify traits that take that idea into the, the kind of person who doesn't back off um, and decide to play at this because it's too scary to do it bigger? Yeah. Well, I think that the woman that came to you and said, this has got to change and I'm shifting. Yeah. Those are the kind of people I want to invest in. Yes because I am so early to the game that I'm really investing in people that have the competitive nature, the scrappy tenacity that is going to build a major business. And if it's not working, they know. They know to change it. I mean, I was sitting on a panel this week with Karen from Nestio, who started in a consumer-facing business originally. And you know, I never really believed that that was where the money was anyhow, and that was the real big business. But they started to see the data and they started realizing after talking to the owners of the businesses that that was where there was a tremendous opportunity. And they pivoted the business. And there was no doubt that they were going to at one point. I knew it. You know, and she tells a story where she came and talked to me and she was super nervous. First money in the company, really wasn't sure, you know, how I'm going to take it. And I listened, I listened, I listened. And then she's like, you know, what do you think? And I just said, well, I knew you would eventually figure it out. Yeah. You know, and that was like, oh, thank God, you know. But, you know, you're a founder and you're building a business and you're building something that people believe in you. We take a huge risk yeah. financially, but you're taking huge personal risk. And I've seen founders that, you know, they almost are hoping that every day is going to be a good day. You know, that they're, they're not, they're not, they don't have that sense of urgency. It's like they don't shift when they see it. You know, they straggle. Um, and, um, and they're not working 24 seven because they have a family and they just, you know, and by the way, it's men too. They have a family and they can't, you know, they're not working the hours they need to. And they're going home at six and they're not around on the weekends and they're not really doing this all the time. You know, and this is not work for the weary. You know, yeah. this is really freaking hard 24 7. And, you know, hopefully you get to a point where you're on top of your business and more of those people are doing this. But that's just the nature of building businesses. And so I'm, I look for people that I think are survivors. So living in the middle of one of the biggest urban centers where there, there's plenty of deal flow. How do women think bigger um, to be able to either compete for that capital or get scrappy so that they can stay alive long enough to get to revenue? Yeah. You know, it's a hard one. I mean, the good news is it's not as expensive to start businesses anymore, right? There's a lot of open source software. There's opportunities to um, do a lot of A-B testing before you really move into it. 
working really hard, hopefully spending very little of your capital as possible. If you can show you get a little success, you might get some friends and family money. Um, but you know, I've seen, listen, I saw a woman in, in Connecticut. She's not that far from New York City. They got a train that goes straight up there. And you know, she took money from investors that you're talking about where a, it was a group of men who, by the way, were very name brand men who ran multi-billion dollar companies, publicly traded companies, had been retired. And in her first C round, they had, she was owed 11% of the business. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then after, wow. then she had to go out and raise more money. And she told me at the beginning, she said, I just want you to know, I only own 11% of the business. And I was like, walk away. Yeah. Walk away. Yeah. She could do it. I get it. Because you're like, oh my God. You know, but in the end she did. And at one point these guys came in to talk to me and I said to them, you've screwed this one. Yeah. You really believe in this business? Restructure the entire cap table, yeah. take what you deserve, and then let her go out and raise capital. Because no one with a brain is going to put any money in this business. I don't care if it's the next best thing to water. Right. It makes no sense. And so I would say to people that are really building businesses, they think are huge opportunities and that are um, really scalable. Um, go to your nearest urban central city, you know, go to Chicago, go to areas like Austin, you know, which is smaller, but there's areas where there are savvy investors. You're probably going to have to give a little more. Um, you probably have a lower valuation. You might have to give up a little more of your company, but there's a level that makes sense and doesn't make sense. And so um, having those kind of investors just so you can move forward and stay home, in the end, it doesn't work. Because yeah. investors don't get to make money or invest without entrepreneurs. Right. Take advantage of really smart people that are building interesting businesses that you're willing to take a risk on with the hope that you can help them build something and your capital will turn into more. Right. It has to be the right entry. And if you're doing this and taking advantage and telling them what to do and how it's going to be and what you're going to own, in the end, zero of zero is zero. Yeah. So, you know, taking that money is just like, it's only going to end up bad. But as far as like crowdfunding, um, do you see that as a viable option or do you see it as chasing a gerbil wheel um, that can cause people to lose uh, focus on what they actually should be doing out to getting to real revenue. Um, I know that's a case by case. It's case by case. And I, listen, I think the most frustrating part about frustrating about fundraising is it sucks. It takes you away from your day-to-day -day thing, which is building your business, right? So now you're out here, you've got to go see someone. It takes time, energy, thought processes. Sometimes you meet with a smart investor, it makes your mind think differently. I think crowdfunding, it takes time and energy as well. There's the right, you got to be on the right platform for you. You have to remember that, you know, I'm going to use Indiegogo and Kickstarter as two opportunities to talk about because Indiegogo, you can put something up. If you don't reach your goal, you still get the money. Yeah. I mean, that's a complete waste, right? What did you learn? Not much, right? You learned to go after your friends and family and people and maybe a decent social media campaign. People liked your product, they gave you money, and then, um, you know, instead of them giving you individual checks, it all went through one platform. Kickstarter, you know, you have to have a certain number, you know what your number is, and if you reach that goal, then you get your money. The best way to start a business, funding from that platform, because you've learned a lot, and once you get to the other side, it's just like you realize how much you learned about fundraising. How much you learned about marketing, how much you learned about social media, how much you learned about leveraging your contacts in order to get this thing going, right? How you learned about, oh my God, I only have $30,000 left. There's 19 days left. We have 100 people that have given to us. How do we tell these people, break it down into simplicity so they get one of each of their friends. If one of each of their friends get $10, we get to their goal, right? So there's all these different thought processes that are very business oriented. And that's what I like about Kickstarter versus all, many of these other platforms is that it's almost like closing your seed round. Interesting. What kind of advice would you give to women who are making that transition 
to actually, because I honestly think that if you're not authentic, um, people don't trust you and they don't resonate or want to help with anything that you're doing. I totally agree. So how, how, do you, how do you advise women to learn to be comfortable in their own skin without coming off as unprofessional? How, how, how to balance that? Well, I think authentic, authenticity is so important, right? You gotta be real. And I think that people see right through it if you're not. Yeah. Um, you know, if you come in, um, and so that's number one, right? And I think the second thing is, it should come through clearly that you believe strongly about your business, that you're drinking your own Kool-Aid, that you are, um, you know, um, and that's number two, right? And both of those things um, come across as authentic. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, when people come in that are timid, that's okay, that are timid, it just doesn't work. You know, when people come in as, um, you know, not conviction about their business, it doesn't work. I think that um, women um, tend to become, as their businesses become stronger, much stronger individuals and more comfortable in their own skin. Um, And um, I think that's just reality. Yeah, I spent a long time apologizing for everything I wasn't. And it took me a long time. Never apologize. (laughs) No. Never apologize. You know, it's funny, my niece, who is in ninth grade, and you know, I've said this to my daughters as well, but she, she texted me the other day because she's uh, going to probably spend a couple of weeks with me this summer, and she really needs to get some babysitting gigs because I was like, you can't sit around doing shit, right? Yeah. I mean, and you're, you're, you're going you're gonna to be unhappy, right? Right. And she texted me, and she said, sorry to bother you, but I want to know, you know if you've heard anything. And so I texted her back and I said, I'm on it. I said, but note to self, never apologize. Unless of course you did something absolutely terrible to me. I deserve an apology. Then do it. Never apologize. You can text me any day. Do not start with, I'm sorry, but I had to contact you. I said, what are you apologizing for? Right. Good advice. (laughs) Not only don't apologize, and I do this anyhow, which is don't start with I think. Yeah. I was at an event years and years and years ago, and it was a large table. It was sort of like this conversational table. And I was sitting next to this guy who I haven't seen in years, and I couldn't get in my thoughts. I wanted to join this conversation. And he turned to me, he said, just jump in, don't say I think. Yeah. What? He's like, women say I think. And that's why there's this I think, and then you want to get in, and everyone's moved past you. Right. So I was like, okay. And I literally just started my conversation, and all of a sudden, everyone was listening to me. And I was just like, wow, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> that, that actually is really interesting, but you're right. We tend to, to say that as if people are then going to wait to hear what we have to think. Right. Um, and they're not. They're not. Yeah. You know? It's just like, state the facts. You know, I even <laughs> say that to women in, in, in when they give me, um, or any entrepreneur, when they send me the deck for the next round, right? Some little things like, don't ask questions. Don't create thought processes. Just state the facts. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you decide what is a yes for you? In terms of who I'm going to invest in? Um, or even with a mentor. Um, you get asked a gazillion questions, requests, help, even in where you're going to show up. How do you decide for you what is yes? That's a great question. Um, and I've made some bad ones in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is, um, you know, I do try to do some evening activities. I try to do very, very few. Yeah. And so it's really, if I really think that that's the right group, right, that I'm going to, like, you know, I spoke at something the other night, there were like 60, 70 women in the room. So I thought it was the right, yeah. 
think it might have been more, I think it might have been a hundred and something people in the room. But I felt like that was a great thing. Like I, I did them a solid, they asked me to do it. I felt like I should do that, right? Yeah. Um, you know, but most of the time, most of the time I say no. I mean, you know, my time is limited. I really want to make a difference. Um, I, I, and I, I, I do hope that I'm speaking to the right group um, and um, where I think there's, I'm adding value to the evening or the conversations so that, you know, when people walk away, that they came away hopefully with some kind of tidbit that might help them in their business. Yeah. So um, I think that's how I make the decision to say yes. Um, but um, I mean, the majority is no. You know, I mean, I was just asked actually to keynote this super cool event in Los Angeles in September. I was like, no, I'm not going out to LA. I'm not going to do it that time period. It doesn't work for me. And, you know, I'm also at a point in my life, like, I don't need to build my brand anymore. You know, I don't need to do these things. Um, and um, uh, it, it is hard to say no, but it's, um, you know, actually it's hard to say yes now. It's easier to say no. You know, it's true. I've got to that point too, um, where I, I do try to focus in some areas on how to get to yes, but the interesting thing is, is that even when you start from there, no is always, always an option. And I'm finding that sometimes it is the right answer, yeah. um, not only to protect my own time, um, but also to protect um, what I'm involved in. Um, uh, not all groups are created equal. And some have an agenda that the more you look into it, you just think, I don't think this is a good fit. And so you start getting a little more strategic what you are and are not involved in. And I don't see that as not getting to yes. I see that as being very clear where yes is. Um, I like that. I mean, I think there's times where I'm asked to do this or that. And it's just like, there's more value. You, you're getting more value out of me than I'm getting out of you. Yes, by yeah. far. That's a bad one. I was like, I just talked to a young woman this week who wants to, do these events through a company which i think is really smart and we talked about it and i said you know she's we're thinking of partnering with some of these companies what do you think i was like you don't need to partner with those companies some of those companies are going to devalue what you're doing you yeah. know i think and i and I, I agree it's the same thing like it all goes back to what is what's the right decision and what's the value i'm providing that's going to provide back to me as well Were there some things you learned out of that process that, that you could share that would help other women as they start to make that transition and how to start exploring how they created an identity for themselves that gives them different opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I started blogging a long time ago and so yes. there weren't that many people doing it, right? So I did it for myself, right? I did it because... I wanted to remain connected to a technology industry and I felt like I owned it and no one else did. And um, it was just like, I enjoyed it, you know? And, um, um, but I would say that even though you are outside of these major urban areas, right? You can build these things anywhere. And it's a matter of finding where your customer is, finding where they're located, finding what interests them, um, you know, if they're hanging out on LinkedIn, then that's where you should be trying to figure out how you get them on your platform. If they're hanging out on Facebook, figure out how you do that on Facebook. You know, how do you get it done organically? Is it worth paying for Facebook ads in order to like then launch something that where you can do more organic traffic? Or is it costing you too much per person because no one's coming onto your platform, so maybe you're on the wrong idea? Doesn't mean that you should be launching something interesting and taking a look at how you could work within Pinterest. I mean, there are all these opportunities, you know? Should you be, you know, writing articles on Medium um, and then finding a way that you can garner an audience through that? Should you be launching something on Tumblr, which tends to be very internal, the people that um, are on Tumblr. I mean, of course, they're building new people, but there's a lot of reposting in, inside Tumblr. Is that the place to start building your brand, gaining some traction, gaining some eyeballs? So I, I think it's a multiple things, and there's a variety of ways to do it. And then obviously, you know, keeping 
your data and seeing what's happening and what works and what doesn't work and what it costs and what it doesn't cost. So, you know, I think now more than ever, the opportunity to build something and you could be in Alaska, it doesn't make any difference. What's kind of cool is that, you know, even if it's a, it's a consumer product that you're built, you're making these fabulous t-shirts, you can put a shop on Etsy. Oh yeah. And there's all these different ways to channel whatever business you want to be in, wherever you are. I think one of the things that is interesting um, is the importance of spreading this new economic growth into all cities, right? So and one of the things they've done in Silicon Valley, which I'm not a fan of, is they found a company in New Mexico that was killing it. And they're like, wow, we're going to totally put money into this, but you need to move We to were told us, that. Right? Yeah. So, they should be thrilled to have a company in a different state, in a different city, yeah. where it might not cost as much for labor. People are so excited to have those jobs, completely loyal, and get on a goddamn plane and go to a board meeting or put it on a Skype. You know, I mean, Steve Case is doing this thing now, a revolution is going across to 75 different cities, and I think it is freaking fantastic. And yeah. it's just like, yeah, why, why should we have everything in San Francisco? Yeah. You know, I mean, New York is spread out, right? Yeah. You know, LA is more spread out, but this is hub of San Francisco, which is like this echo chamber. And it's gone to the point people can't afford to live there. I mean, what is the point of that? Shouldn't we be spreading that love across the country? How did your first job set you up um, for the mindset that you have today? And how should we be looking at our experience from 10, 15 years ago and what value it actually brings to what we're doing today? You know, it's funny. Um, I had this conversation at a panel the other night is that, and I said, they, they, the audience was much older um, and there were young people on the panel and me. And uh, I, they said, well, what, what can we provide? We can learn so much from you, right? This woman who had to be in her late 60s. And, you know, I said, you know, what's interesting is that for all these young entrepreneurs is that these companies have not changed. If you go deep inside companies that are doing, they're changing industries. They're not getting rid of HR people. They're creating better tools for HR people. They're not making a garment any different than they used to. They just can make more for less money and they don't need to make 1,200 units at a time. So all of these things are just getting better with technology. And I think when I look back at my experience in retail, the thing that I learned immediately in my first job was it's all about the people. It's all about learning how to manage. It's all about um, knowing that there is a next job if I do well in this job, that there's upward mobility in the company. Um, taking on more responsibility, making more money. And it also taught me about margins and waste and turn and um, uh, product mix um, and all of those things, sales. I mean, it was literally down the line of all the things that I learned. But I think the most important thing I learned, which is still important today, is about people yeah. and relationships, transparency, reviews, structure in regards to there is upward mobility in this company. And I see companies that they keep someone in a job because they're good at it, the person will eventually leave. They're not giving that person an opportunity to build themselves. Or someone micromanages a company. And that, you know, I couldn't micromanage that first job. There was 150 people that worked for me. You, you know, micromanaging people, you clip their wings. If you let them fly, the company will fly and things will succeed and people will do really good at what they're good at. And you'll figure out who is shitty at flying and who's <laughs> great at flying. And you cut them off and you get someone else who can fly higher. Yes. You know, so I think those are some of the things that I learned. And, and in regards to what I was talking about before is technology. I think that's one of the things that I've really learned in companies where I've been involved in and saying, listen, I know we're changing this industry. I know this is all technology, but you still need a customer service person. And the difference now is you used to have a customer service person that could only talk to 10 people a day. Now they can talk to 150. Yeah. 
So technology has changed in that, right? So we're more efficient companies. We don't need as much capital. We don't need as big a labor force, right. which is a whole other story and why we're where we are today. Yeah. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about people. Do you have a mentor? Do you have people you reach out to for advice? And the reason I ask is if you do, what made you choose who you did to ask for help? And what advice would you give to women about who to ask for help? Because I think sometimes they always reach out for the shiny stars when it may not be the person who actually has the time or interest or investment to actually be a true mentor to them. And yeah, well, first of all, I think mentorship should be organic. I do too. I mean, this concept of like people like, can you be my mentor? It's just like, if you need a shrink, you get one. Right? <laughs> but I think mentorship should be organic. And they can be someone who's younger than you, the same age as you or older than you. Um, I've been actually having this conversation um, as of recent. And, um, you know, the truth is, is that I have... I paved a new frontier in the way that I built, do what I do. Yeah. Um, and so there was no one that I could say to, I kind of want to do what you're doing, you know, so could you, you know, help me, yeah. um, you know, but I really never had a mentor. I mean, I think there were a couple of people I worked for at points in my life that took me under their wings, but then they got promoted, you know, this was in my early years and then that was it. Like they didn't maintain that relationship with me. Yeah. Um, unfortunate but it's true um and so you know i would say you know my mentors are everywhere i mean who do i really talk to and ask advice for is my husband yeah alex she's in my office all day you know <laughs> I trust her opinion. um my kids totally trust their opinion good friends that i know people in business i mean i think it's who you know people that I really trust that I feel is going to give me some really solid advice. Um, but there's no one on a constant. Um, I really have not had that kind of mentorship. Um, and um, be it good or bad, um, I think that it's really nice to have someone in your career who is um, uh, keeping a good eye out for you and telling you, you know, reality. Yeah. And so you're right. That's who I've always gone back to is people who are honest with me, who tell me the truth, even when I don't want to hear it. Yeah. Stay focused. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for your time. It, it means a lot.